sex, you're going to get sex. Actual intercourse. Intercourse. The K2 investigators expose what's really going on behind closed doors at Portland's full nude lingerie modeling shops. And tonight, insiders tell our Tom Jensen about the sex, the money, and the underage girls of the lingerie modeling industry. K2 special investigation, undressed and unregulated. Welcome to Triple X Church, where the worshiping is for fully nude models. I worked there and was making thousands of dollars. A business was registered at the address as Triple X Church, a tax-exempt religious organization with the Oregon Secretary of State's office by its owner, Ben Cunningham. But the name on the marquee is Pussycats. There are five Pussycats in Portland and Salem, and Nikki says she knows exactly what goes on inside because she worked there. If you want to get a job, you're going to get a job. If you want to have sex, you're going to get sex. Actual intercourse. Intercourse. Nikki says Cunningham makes it clear. Models will make his customers happy. So basically he said you either have sex with the customers. And him. Or what? You are off the schedule, he would fire you. As far as what he made. Terry Dunn, her husband and daughter, managed Pussycats for Cunningham for almost a year while Cunningham traveled through Central America. While he was home on visits, they say they witnessed Cunningham's pressure on girls to, quote, do whatever it takes to make customers happy. All he wants is his cut from it. Really? So tell me that so that's Cunningham. not being a pimp. Email and money transfers between the Duns and a traveling Ben Cunningham show Pussycats was bringing in fifteen to thirty thousand dollars cash every week, half of it going directly to Cunningham. The Duns say they discovered some of the girls earning that cash were not adults. You ran into a couple you thought were underage, so you let them go. Was Downtown was the worst. Yeah. Terry says she fired three girls at that location, the Triple X Church, when she found out they weren't even old enough to buy cigarettes. I found more. Jenny, aka Asian Peach, was just 15 when she started working at Pussycats on Southeast Foster, according to official sources who investigate this industry and the illegal sex trade. Lala started there when she was 16, according to former employees. Over the phone, Lala tells me she left Pussycats when she turned 18. The pictures are from websites where the girls advertise as escorts. We're sorry your kids have to see this, you guys. I first told you about Cunningham more than three years ago when his lingerie models paraded past families outside storefronts and along a busy Southeast Division Avenue. He didn't answer numerous emails, but in a recent phone call, he denied knowingly hiring underage girls or encouraging prostitution. Can you talk to us about what's going on? I finally found him outside one of his clubs, and again, he denied that allegation. Are you out of your mind? He's in no mood to answer questions and starts pulling away from his business on Northeast 82nd. Why are you so afraid to talk to us about this if you're not prostituting young girls? There are dozens of these lingerie modeling shops in Portland. Lisa Lighthizer says no one is keeping an eye on them, and the owners know it. They do as little as possible to bring in as many, mon as many dollars as they can. Lighthizer started a group called SOS Oregon after neighbors complained the shops hurt neighborhoods and businesses. They need to be regulated. They can't regulate themselves, someone needs to regulate them. Most strip clubs have booze, food, and gambling. They're regulated by the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, the Health Department, and the Lottery. Without those things, a lingerie shop flies lower on the legal radar. You have to jump through, through more hoops to buy a cigarette in this town than you have to go and walk into one of these places and, and buy sex. Tom Jensen, K2 News. This is a problem nationally, and now, as we've discovered, locally as well. We found at least a half dozen ads on the Portland Craigslist in the last month making an unusual pitch. I help you with your bills if you share your love with me. Frank of Wilsonville is looking for Mrs. Wright. She may be struggling to get by, and Frank is willing to help with rent and other bills as long as she meets his personal needs. My reaction is, really? <laughs> I mean, really? You just advertise for this? Sergeant Mike Geiger of the Portland Police Sexual Assault Unit has never seen this kind of ad here. You know, engaging in a sexual act or sexual contact with another person, you know, where there is a fee involved is prostitution. Is that what Frank really wants? We went undercover to find out, answering his ad and others showing up on Portland Craigslist. Frank asks us to meet him at this fast food place in Wilsonville. 
he wants to know if we're cops because this could get him in trouble. He says he'll pay about half our rent each month, about $300. In exchange, he wants us to come over three or four times a week for sex, with cuddling before and after, he says, to make an emotional connection. Well, of course it's laughable, because if you want an emotional connection with somebody, um, you're not going to set up a circumstance where you pay them to have sex with you. But Sergeant Geiger is worried that local women in desperate financial situations could fall for these offers. He says rent for sex offers are not just criminal, they're dangerous. He sees men who advertise rent for sex as possibly controlling, arrogant, even predatory. And now you're with a person who expects something from you and will then demand it from you and may take it from you. You've now placed yourself in significant harm. I wanted you to meet a friend of mine. What is Frank's view? Sir, we're doing a news story on people who try to have sex with women for rent money. We don't know if he or the other advertisers are dangerous or fit the sergeant's profile. He did not stay to fill us in. Well, I was thinking about what you wrote in your ad. Don from Southeast Portland advertised for a college girl in need of help with tuition and rent, calling it, quote, our own dirty little secret. He wants to meet at a Southeast Portland coffee shop. He tells us he'll pay about a third of our rent, $200 a month, plus gas, food, and other expenses. In return, he wants a physical relationship intimate time with a younger woman. He says, quote, maybe it's a midnight phone call saying, man, I could sure use some, you know? Get your <laughs> over here, you know what I mean? Hi there, sir. We would like to know what he means, but he did not elaborate. Why did you advertise to pay someone's bills for sex? Neither Don nor Frank has been arrested nor charged with a crime, but detectives want the people who post rent for sex ads to know Police are on to them. If you think for a moment that nobody understands what you're doing, you're wrong. If you think that you can just get away with this and treat people this way, you're also wrong about that as well. We contacted Craigslist about this, but have not heard back. We do know that Craigslist is monitoring the adult section of its site for illegal postings. However, these ads are appearing in a different section of their site. Carrie Tomlinson, K2 News. Detectives already started getting fresh information and in a few minutes we'll give you a number to call with tips. The time gone by 25 years in the first case may actually help homicide detectives. They're hoping people who know something about these murders will be brave enough to come forward now and tell them who the killer is. They all have one thing in common. Young girls walking alone or in pairs along a coastal highway who vanish. But I'll break down and bawl like a baby at times. Just thinking about it, I still do. Floyd Essen lost his youngest daughter, Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer Essen was just 15 when she disappeared along Highway 101 near Mulac State Beach, north of Newport. They took my little girl from me and, and uh, to me, that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a wound that will never heal. Essen isn't sure who they is, and neither are detectives from the Oregon State Police Major Crimes Unit and Lincoln County Sheriff's Department. 1443. We went with them looking at a 14-year-old crime scene up an old logging road northeast of Mulac Beach. Where are we at About now? 50 yards. About 50 yards. This is the spur road. It's going to come around and kind of hook in below us. The landing is over there then. Right. Where the body of Jennifer Essen was found two weeks after her disappearance, lying right next to her friend, 16-year-old Kara Lees, both strangled. They were covered with brush. There was there were uh, sticks and branches and things over top of them. Crime scene photos never before seen publicly show one of the first clues, a girl's shoe. So it's going to be right in here. Yep and aerials of the spot where the girls were killed or later left under all that brush in a new clear cut. So they were found in there, but quite a number of yards in there, but this is all obviously 14 years of growth. Now Lincoln County District Attorney Rob Bovet is taking a fresh look at the double murder along with three other homicides, which all could be linked by a common killer or killers. That's why I had all five homicides reopened at the same time because of the potential for a connection. Three years before the Essen Lee's murders in May 1992, two other girls vanished. 
also along Highway 101 north of Newport. The girls were last seen making a call from this phone booth while their families camped at Beverly Beach State Park. Hunters found the bodies of 17-year-old Melissa Sanders and 19-year-old Sheila Swanson off of Highway 20 four months later in October 1992. It was just a few miles from where another girl disappeared eight years earlier. 17-year-old Kelly Disney, last seen walking east along Highway 20 at one in the morning in March 1984. Her mother talked to K2 in 1994, 10 years after her disappearance. You can't describe it, and especially not knowing. And just days after our story aired, someone found Kelly Disney's skull near this reservoir north of Newport. 10 years after she disappeared, the first clue for investigators and her family after a decade. Now I know and now I can get on with our lives. This team of murder detectives hopes the killer or killers or someone who knows who they are will finally step forward and give all of the family some answers. I'm hopeful that time will actually be our friend in this case, um, that relationships have changed, that uh, people have grown older. For many of folks around here though, however, it's still pretty fresh and it can be pretty painful. Ready? Go play. You can't tell now, Joshua Reynolds' puppy, Moxie, was gravely ill just a matter of weeks ago. <laughs> Moxie was diagnosed with Parvo, which came with a $2,400 vet bill. We were expecting something that was gonna be another member of our family and healthy, and, and she was, uh, she was deathly ill. Joshua got his dog through this website, Tiny Paws Puppy Rescue, based in Washington County. It describes itself as a small, all-volunteer organization dedicated to the rescue of lost, abandoned, surrendered, sick, abused, and relinquished animals. It also says Tiny Paws Puppy Rescue is a 501c3 nonprofit founded in 2001. But IRS records say that's not true. The nonprofit application wasn't filed until this past July. Tiny Paws lists pets for sale on PetFinder.com at $350 and $400 each, saying some were provided to them after being seized from a breeder in Portland, a breeder bust in Longview, or in Clackamas, as well as pugs taken from a breeder bust in Washington County. I can tell you we have never had pug puppies in any kind of a seizure here in Washington County. And if we'd had two adorable little eight-week pug puppies, we would not have turned them over to an organization that we'd never heard of to sell to people without spaying and neutering them. So we knew that she was lying. We checked with each county, and they all say the same thing. Tiny Paws is lying. Tiny Paws says it currently doesn't have a shelter, so they meet potential buyers in this Beaverton Park. Hey, okay. How old is he? That's where our producer John met Brene Randolph of Tiny Paws to look at a Pomeranian mixed puppy. Oh. Yeah, we're just an accidental litter. Yeah, we're Channel 2 News, and we want to know where you're getting these dogs from. Um, it depends. Um, we get a couple dogs from like owner surrender, so people will call us when they need help. Brene, or Bree as she calls herself, tells us she gets many of the dogs from people advertising puppy litters on Craigslist. I just took over the rescue over. over. Says you're getting dogs from Washington County. Washington I just County. took the, the rescue over, so you have to go interview. Okay, you need to tell me who I need to interview then. Go ahead and Sherry, Sherry Weeklander is who used to own the rescue. Okay. I just took it over. I just put my application in for the business registration. Because Bree kept blaming the same person. Okay, so her name is Sherry. There was a person, her name was Sherry Weeklander, W-I-K-L-A-N-D-E-R. And Bree kept telling us she's just been a low-level volunteer. I actually just took over the rescue. I just barely started taking it over last month. I just took it over. We wanted to ask Sherry Wicklander why she dumped all of Tiny Paws' lies on Bree, especially because PetFinder.com tells us a doctor, Sherry Wicklander, wrote a letter of recommendation for Tiny Paws to get on PetFinder's website. I can try calling. But when Bree tried to call Wicklander, she's not answering. The phone number disconnected. When we started looking for Sherry Wicklander under either spelling, we found she doesn't seem to exist. Her name doesn't appear in any public records. We've also learned the PetFinder.com application was submitted three years ago by a Bree Mata Haas. 
Public records show Bree Randolph sharing addresses with several people with the last name of Mata. Further, a Dr. Sarah Shelty, who's also listed on Tiny Paws website and documents, doesn't seem to exist either, according to state veterinary records. Moxie. Leaving Probably. Joshua Reynolds wondering if Bree made up or morphed all the names and whether his puppy was ever vaccinated. Are you going to pay the $2,400? I can't pay the $2,400, but they do sign a contract stating that they could pay for the medical expenses. Within a matter of days of our questioning, Bree Randolph took the Tiny Paws website down. Petfinder.com suspended Tiny Paws account based on what we found. What I worry about is I think that because of your hard work, um, she's been found out here. But what happens if she goes to Seattle or Los Angeles or New York or wherever she may go to next and starts the whole thing all over again. Washington County Animal Services tracked Tiny Paws sales of 111 puppies since May and figure they brought in $40,000. If you use the number posted on their website of 189 puppies adopted out, that's more like 70,000. Dan Tilkin, K2 News. They travel around neighborhoods looking for victims. K2 investigator Tom Jensen caught them in the act today as they tried to collect cash from a victim. You guys do not have a license to do this. No, no you don't have a license. Hey, and you know what? You already busted up. your uncle. What are you doing? Yeah, come on. This is against the law. This is theft. This is theft. When they saw Tom, Paver sped off in their yellow pickup. And Tom, the victim tells you this is the same people you busted for shoddy work years ago. He identified two of them after paying them $400 cash. And when they came back for another 500 bucks, we were there to greet them. The deal was so good, Michael Billingsley couldn't pass it up. They just showed up and said that yeah, we're in the neighborhood, we have some um, extra materials, we can give you all a really good deal. Michael says he agreed to pay James Valentine Stanley $1,000 for the paving job, and then he saw the final product. This is just some really bad dirt. Stanley has no license to work in Oregon and owes the state contractor's board more than $5,600 in fines and restitution. Michael's roommate wanted to pay Stanley with a $1,000 check. And then immediately dropped to $900 within a couple hours later because they said they didn't want the check, they wanted cash. Michael did some research wow. online and found our story on K2. He says he recognized another man with James, his uncle, as the same man I confronted back in 2008 about another paving scam. You don't have a license to operate well, as a paver. Let me show you one thing here. Yeah. Will you back that off? That Stanley swore he was leaving Oregon for good and never coming back. He has no contractor's license and owes almost $30,000 in fines and restitution. The same gentleman that was on your new show was actually the same gentleman that had uh, came to pick up the money. So Michael set up a sting. I just ha went to the bank. I got cash. So uh, call me as soon as you can come and pick up the money. Agreeing to pay the pavers another $500 in cash. Minutes later, two workers showed up at the agreed-upon meeting site waiting to get the money. As soon as a passenger in the truck sees me, he leaps into the driver's seat and starts yelling at the other man, let's go. You guys do not have a license to do this. Yeah, do no, you don't have a license. Hey, and you know what? You already busted your uncle. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah, this is against the law. I'll kick your this is theft. This is theft. I'm get you, boy. They sped off through the parking lot and down Northeast Sandy with us and an upset victim in their rearview mirror. Justice will be served because I will track them down and get my money. CCB is investigating. A great reminder for everyone out there. Watch out for these people who come to your home promising great paving or roofing deals or any of that handyman work. If they knock on your door and it sounds like it's too good to be true, it probably is. Also, make sure that any of these contractors are licensed with CCB and also that they're in good standing. Is this only happening right around our area, Tom, then? As far as we can tell, this has been going on around the country with this same family of pavers. However, they do have one family member here in Gresham who appears to be completely clean and above board and has a good record, and you have to feel bad for that guy.